Today we're going to talk about the first of our major social institutions. And a social institution is simply a structure of relationship, obligation, role, and function. What this means is that it's kind of this entity that has been developed by people to meet their perceived needs. And some of the social institutions are political systems, economic systems, religion, education, the aesthetics, and there we're talking about the arts, and family. So these are just some of the examples. And today what we're going to talk about is economics. <coughs> so economy is a system of production, distribution, and consumption. So here we have some graphics to illustrate this. The first one, the actual construction of planes, so that's our production. The next one, we have production of energy occurring and then distributing it out to houses. And then consumption is what people themselves or individuals or groups um, consume. The mode of production, there are two basic kinds. There's the capitalist and there's the non-industrial. And the capitalist is the money to buy labor, non-industrial is generally labor or production through some kind of social obligation and generally that's a kin based obligation. So here we have a, a Navajo woman who is hand weaving textiles and that's an example of the non-industrial type of production. Now the means of production, here we're talking primarily about labor, technology, and land and who owns the land. So labor, is it human versus machine? With the technology, is it handmade tools or is it machine made? And anthropology sometimes refer to that as simple versus complex. And that is not a qualitative term. So we're not trying to say that handmade tools are worse and machine made tools better. It's just a way to describe them, <coughs> one being you simply make them by hand and one you have machines that make them. But I want to talk a little bit more about land and the ownership itself. Who owns it? Is it collectively owned? Is it individually owned? Or does the government ownership? And this changes with the type of subsistence strategy. And we're going to talk about those more in our next lecture. So with foragers, there's no private ownership. People need to be able to use all and any of the resources that are available within that particular area. Uh, resource availability isn't predictable, so they actually have to have a pretty large land area to be able to exploit things as they come into season. And if one area seems to be having drought, maybe another microclimate is doing okay. Um, the exception to this happens to be river-based foragers who generally have a more communal idea about land and or individual ownership. And some people think this is because fish is a more predictable resource. I'm not totally convinced of that argument yet, but that is the primary one. Horticulturalists have communal ownership of land and plots are allocated to families. And this is because as fo soil fertility decreases, it's necessary to let land lie fallow, which means it's unworked. And you have to be able to move your field to a new area, so that needs a lot of land. Pastoralists are kind of a combination of both a foraging strategy there and the horticultural one in that they need a large land area to be able to move their herds um, so everybody has free access to pasture land and the land is communally held but the animals themselves are private property so we are starting to see that concept of private property emerge. As with most groups, there is some variability. The Baluch, who live in Iran, Pakistan, and Afghanistan claim territory and actually defend it. So it is important to keep in mind that there's always going to be some group that is the exception to the generalities that we're talking about. Intensive agriculture, private property rules, individual ownership of land and all of its resources is a given. They most of people who practice intensive agriculture, and this primarily was some of the reasons that there were so many pro problems between European colonialists and indigenous peoples, is because of this concept of communally holding land or not owning it at all and private ownership. <coughs> but most people that practice intensive agriculture believe that communal ownership leads to over-exploitation, when in fact most of the evidence suggests quite the contrary. So the Barana, who live in Ethiopia, produce more animal protein at a lower cost than Australian cattle ranchers. And you might ask, why are we comparing Ethiopia and Australia? Well, the climates are actually fairly similar. Uh, groups with communal land usually monitor their resources more carefully and they move before they're over-exploited. 
Now the means of distribution, there are a couple different ways <coughs> that goods, resources, get out to all the people. And we're going to talk about reciprocity, we're going to talk about redistribution, and we're going to talk about the market principle. And we're going to talk about reciprocity first. And this is the exchange between social equals, and this usually is kinship, marriage, friendship, something along that lines. And we have two types of reciprocity. We have generalized reciprocity, and we have balanced reciprocity. <coughs> generalized reciprocity is you give to someone without the expectation of immediate return. So here we have some Kung hunters, and whoever gets the kill will share it with the others with no expectation of like, hey, you're, I'm going to give you some meat, you're going to give me a yam, or something like that. Um, or family pooling of resources is another example of this generalized reciprocity. Now, balanced reciprocity is where the giver expects something of equal value in return, and that value is determined by the parties involved. So here, we have an example of like a baby shower, where the mother-to-be is receiving gifts, and everybody that's there actually has it in the back of their mind that if when it's their turn to have a baby, they'll be getting gifts in return, and something of equal value. So gift giving in the U.S. is sometimes considered balanced reciprocity. So we have gift obligations. You're obliged to give, to extend social ties to other persons or groups, um, to refuse as rejection of that offered relationship and can lead to some bad feelings or even hostilities. Um, the obligation to repay is implied with every gift so that we expect to get a future gift and if we don't get one then people are often considered cheap or unappreciative. Now both generalized and balanced reciprocity are based on trust and some type of social tie but we do also have negative reciprocity and negative reciprocity is where one party tries to get the better of the other party and this could be through hard bargaining could be through deception um, some examples would be horse raiding um, selling prepared foods to a captive market so s street vendors are considered an example of negative reciprocity now redistribution, this is when goods and services move to a central authority, and this could be a king, it could be a chief, it could be a government, and these goods are then sorted, allocated, and redistributed out to the people. Now one of the best examples of this actually occurred here in the Pacific Northwest, and that's the potlatch, which is the picture you can see here on the left. And the potlatch is where the chief would be collecting goods from people, usually in some kind of a tribute for even up to a year, maybe more, and then they would hold this massive feast and give everything away. And uh, the more they could give away, the higher status they had in the community. So their wealth was actually in giving things away. Now the market principle, of course, most of us are familiar with because that's what we live in on a day-to-day -day basis. And this is where items are bought and sold either directly, could be through barter, or indirectly, which is through money and pricing. Um, and the goal here is to maximize profit. Um, value is determined by supply and demand, and we're free to spend as much or as little as we choose. Now the one thing about supply and demand, which was supposed to regulate prices and keep it competitive so that consumers could actually afford things, is easily manipulated. So if you think about the toy market at Christmas, uh, they'll only produce a limited supply of something that's a highly prized toy that they've marketed to be a highly prized toy and that way they can up the prices because of the the low supply. Um, but supermarkets and open air markets are both examples of the market principle but on different scales. So that's it for economics. Uh, of course it's much more complicated than this but due to the time constraints we have in the quarter we're just going to get some real basic ideas here of what an economic system is.